All right, it is two o'clock, so we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Shelley Reed, the manager of Legal Services National Technology Assistance Project, or LSNTAP for short. And I am thankful that you're here today. We're here to hear from a great panel about software selection. And I'm going to turn it over to the lead of the panel, John Greiner, to introduce all the speakers and get us started. Um, good uh, afternoon and good morning to some, perhaps. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, I just want to um, uh, uh, first uh, let folks know that um, uh, that unfortunately one of our panelists um, uh, is uh, is stuck midair, and so uh, she won't be uh, joining us. Um, we're hoping that Hamra gets uh, um, gets home eventually. She's been traveling or been trying to get back for for two days, um, and so she regrets not being able to join us. Um, uh, and we are going to do our best to sort of fill in um, the content that she was going to provide. Um, but of course, you know, I, I think if, if at the after uh, the webinar, if um, uh, if she's up for it, we'll maybe share a little bit more in terms of the resources about some of what she was going to present. Um, but uh, with me um, today, in addition to, to Shelley, um, uh, uh, Reed is uh, Jay Singleton, um, who um, uh, has been in the legal services community for you know quite a few years. Has, won a number of, uh, of, of awards, but has been you know, relevant to this uh, webinar, um, uh, sort of a focal point in Minnesota, helping, um, uh, well, broadly speaking, helping with a lot of, of various projects, but you know, helping with a lot of technology related initiatives, including uh, working collaboratively around software selection. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and Stacey uh, Hobner, um, uh, Hover, sorry, um, uh, has, um, uh, Sort of brought the, the executive director's role into focus. Um, uh, of um, oh, sorry, it's, uh, she's a um, someone who has a um, I would say a, a very tech forward um, perspective on uh, the delivery of legal services and has been for many years. Has been part of a, a number of uh, California statewide um, uh, partnerships. That's how uh, Stacey and I first met. Um, and, uh, and of course, has led her um, uh, organization through um, uh, the, you know, the COVID uh, transitions and, and um, uh, really appreciate uh, uh, Stacy actually during um, the height of the pandemic helping uh, with other webinars to help uh, uh, share some of her experience in, in pivoting and helping everyone uh, continue the delivery uh, of services. Um, so uh, I guess to kick off, I'm going to be providing a little bit of, um, of context. Um, uh, the, the, the panel, actually five of us got together to sort of work on what you know, is involved in software selection and some of the, the, um, the lessons um, that, uh, um, uh, that we've learned and, and also some of uh, what we've learned from you know, uh, uh, webinars that we've gone to or, or um, uh, resources that we've found. Um, uh, and uh, before we do that, I guess what we would love to hear from uh, folks attending today is is uh, a little bit. Oh, sorry, my um, uh, there we go. Um, is a little bit of um, uh, in chat, a little bit about sort of your successes and and uh, let's say misses in the uh, software selection or system selection process. Um, uh, we'd like to make sure that this is. Um, sorry, I'm not sure why my uh, let me pause there. Um, uh, we want to make sure that uh, that we're you know tailoring the conversation um, uh, you know to the you know to the folks in attendance in attendance, but also I think provide a little bit more context. Um, you know, software selection, as we'll get into, can be as simple, well, maybe not so simple as selecting a new um, uh, anti-malware piece of software, or as complex as as a case management system. Um, but we'd like to get a sense of, of who's uh, joining us today, um, what your role is and experience has been with software selection and and uh, um, and maybe what you you might share. So if you wouldn't mind uh, dropping those um, experiences in the chat, um, uh, Shelly and I and and uh, and Jane Stacy will be um, uh, looking at those and trying to weave that into our um, discussion. Um, so, you know, we um, and hopefully my screen will not auto advance now. I, I hit, hit the pause button. Um, uh, so, in in preparing for this webinar, we were oh no, it's doing that again. Um, I am sorry, I'm, I haven't had that happen uh, before. Also, hopefully it it won't do that um, quite so much. I 
it may have been uh, um, some paper that I have on my desk. Uh, you know, we we uh, were talking about sort of how um, uh, you know a smart software selection process is important, um, and uh, you, you know there you know, typically there um, in any sort of uh, product area, any software or system area, there are multiple solutions. Um, but picking the right system can can make you know a significant difference in um, how well it's adopted, how well you know people you know obviously use the software, whether it integrates fully, um, whether it you win over some of your staff, whether they're um, uh, whether they feel like their needs have been addressed. Um, uh, it certainly um, uh, can help you support your mission. Um, you know, in terms of you know, for instance, like an online intake. Um, uh, a system, you know, how do we increase access to our services? How do we make access more equitable? Um, uh, and uh, and it's it's also typically something that that um, is uh, a significant investment. Um, uh, we don't always, you know, we don't change our software or systems very regularly, or we try not to. It can be very disruptive, um, and we, um, you know, ultimately want to have enough support to continue that process because it's it's usually there's you know um, as Jay's going to talk about with um, uh, with a you know collaborative software selection process once once we you know generate some success it helps us build uh, momentum to to um, you know move forward with additional software additional system uh, advancements um, so it, it lays the groundwork for um, uh, for future uh, projects. Um, you know, success built on success. Um, but, but so, and you may have a, additional, I see there, you know, Sarah's offered some comments. You may have some additional uh, reasons why, you know, it's important to have uh, a smart software selection process. Um, but um, what, what follows basically are some of the things that we think are key to that process um, in actually doing the work. And, and certainly, you know, a big part of that is defining um, what the business need is. Um, not uh, not really a technical uh, piece of it at first, and so for instance, you know, we, we just talked about with online intake, um, we have a hard hard time reaching certain populations. Maybe language access is an issue, um, so we're trying to define it in terms of of the work we do, uh, in terms of our mission, uh, in terms of how it will uh, impact our staff or our volunteers, um, and uh, and that there's a compelling. Um, uh, uh, a benefit to um, making the right software selection and that people will uh, understand why we're um, investing this time in the process and this time and this money in the software and the implementation project management and so forth. Um, uh, and again, it, it, it's not one size fits all. I, I mentioned, you know, like if you're buying new antivirus or anti malware software, it's a, it's a different scale. Um, uh, but you still need to explain to um, probably your ED, your um, uh, uh, your director of operations, why you're spending this additional money, that it's going to help protect um, uh, your system so that your staff will be more reliably um, able to get their work done, that your client data will be better protected. Um, in other cases, a case management system, you know, it, 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 you know it's going to be probably a little bit more apparent when you have um, folks involved who are actually using the system in helping to define the need, they, they're typically coming to you with with specific um, complaints about the current system, or they they've identified opportunities with other systems that they'd like to take advantage of. Um, so developing that um, uh, uh, list of requirements, um, and and again that that sort of um, uh, understanding of what you're trying to accomplish at, a, at a, in a plain language um, way, not you know you don't necessarily need to have the techies in the room at that point. Um, is really important to um, uh, uh, sort of set um, the right objectives for the project um, uh, and and get the buy-in or the initial buy-in um, uh, and then help you in your more technical um, process that follows. Um, just a quick note, one of the things that uh, I think has come up um, over the years for most programs, if you go back far enough, is this notion of, of building tools, um, building software used to um, have more programs that have built their own homebrewed case management system. Um, I think people newer to the community probably would find that hard to believe. Um, um, but but generally, I think the the, the strong consensus among um, everybody on the panel, um, and I think Shelly as well, is, is really try to avoid 
um, getting into the software development business. Um, if you can buy it, that's, that's definitely preferable. If it might need tailoring, it starts to get a little edge, you know, dodgy because you know, then there, you know, those costs might not be so uh, certain or the timeline for that development work that the vendor might need to put into it. Um, and we'll talk to some of those um, pieces um, later in, in uh, um, uh, you know, that Jay and, and Stacey are going to uh, um, go over. Um, uh, a governance process again for software and, and, and we, we were going back and forth between software and system selection because sometimes it's a little blurry, um, but, but understand what your decision-making process is going to be. Um, and, it, and again, if it's a very technical piece of software, it's probably gonna be your IT lead and maybe your finance director. Um, but if it's gonna affect your, um, your advocates, your legal work supervision, you're gonna probably wanna make sure that, that the decision-making process is established so that folks understand who's gonna be involved, what their opportunities are for comment, what, what the, um, uh, uh, the feedback mechanisms will be to help resolve issues maybe after that selection process or, or you know, the trade-offs um, that you're most likely going to have to manage. Um, uh, another sort of, uh, we, we thought sort of important point was, um, you know, how do you resource it? And, and again, it sort of goes with governance. If it's a very small technical piece of software, um, you don't need um, to have um, as uh, many folks involved. You may not need to uh, spend as much time uh, doing a lot of testing and demoing of like, you know, uh, 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 again, uh, uh, maybe going back to the security software. Um, but on the flip side, there may be pieces, you know, for instance, um, you know, there's, you know, VPN clients that help folks get into their offices remotely. You may want to think about, well, how is this going to affect the user community, the user, you know, base in your organization? And so having um, some users involved um, so that they can weigh in, at least in, in terms of the user experience, um, on the selection of a VPN client. Um, uh, because, and that's actually from our experience, been a really important um, piece of software for users that's a very technical tool, um, but can lead to a great deal of frustration. So um, thinking about how you're resourcing um, uh, uh, the, the project is important. Um, uh, that goes along with time, how much you know, time are you gonna allow for it? Um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, committing, you know, folks is, you know, the, the, most folks are, are gonna be, you know, wearing at least a couple hats already. And so this is wearing an additional hat um, so being realistic in terms of uh, timeline is important um, uh, and also being really clear about everybody's role. Um, and then the, the budgeting you know, piece, um, we weren't talking so much about budgeting for the selection process, but, um, but developing um, a, a more detailed budget, um, uh, both for the uh, um, initial procurement implementation, project management, um, uh, uh, training launch, um, but also for that ongoing maintenance um, uh, uh, management enhancement um, uh, that, that you're ready to continue to um, get the most out of that software that you're selecting. Um, and you know, it, it, again, it, it, it varies based on the type of uh, software that you're looking at. So in some cases there isn't really a lot of extra enhancement or configuration. Um, let's say on some PDF software, it, you sort of get you know the the functionality that that the uh, Adobe may have provided, for instance. Um, but with the case management systems, we all know that there's um, sort of your initial implementation, um, and um, the program continues to evolve. Your needs continue to evolve, and so you need to be budgeting for that ongoing cost. Um, one, uh, uh, you know, I guess one other area, and this goes um, back to um, some of the work that LSNTAP and and uh, and others have done around security, is is really sort of thinking about. Um, uh, it, it's doing that again. I, I've got a haunted computer today. Um, uh, is, is really thinking about sort of what the security implications are, um, in, including um, any compliance requirements um, uh, that um, you may need to uh, be cognizant of, like, you know, if you're gonna be um, uh, uh, dealing with uh, private medical information um, uh, and, and you might be covered by HIPAA, you know, so you make, basically making sure that you're um, uh, this goes to some extent back to your requirements, but that you're um, thinking through all the, the various security issues, um, including um, you know, the practices of your vendor 
um, uh, any team members that are involved um, or, or consultants that might be involved with the project. Um, uh, obviously, legal aid generally deals with a, a lot of uh, confidential privileged information and a lot of these projects touch on that data. And so it's really important um, uh, that you um, make a point of doing an evaluation, both of sort of what your needs are and what the vendors are doing. Um, uh, and then, you know, again, uh, this sort of ties into the broader vendor valuation, uh, you know, their commitment, for instance, to the community, if it's a, a very specialized piece of software, like a case management system, um, you know, their, their knowledge of, of your needs, what their development cycles are, so are they going to continue to enhance and advance um, the platform that you're, you're buying into? Um, uh, again, partly because we, it's in most cases, it's a little challenging to, you know, keep flipping between um, uh, pieces of software or, or again, like a, you know, telephone uh, VoIP system, for instance, um, because of all the training and the upheaval, um, you want to make sure that you're, 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 you're sort of building a relationship with a vendor that, that um, is going to be um, aligned with your needs going forward, not just um, those today. Um, and again, I think we're going to get into a little bit more of the, the, the selection, but getting, you know, getting into the um, sort of you, you know, the, the selection process once you have several um, uh, different uh, solutions um, uh, from different vendors, um, you know, having a more formalized process. Now that can be through um, an RFP. Um, in, in, in some instances, the bigger projects, it definitely, I, I, think, I think we'd all agree, strongly makes sense to build that RFP. But even in in, uh, in, in sort of smaller um, uh, uh, projects, having some sort of formalized approach to um, selecting um, uh, your vendor, whether it's making sure that everybody comes in, does the demo, answers a set of questions, um, uh, that you uh, that you have some, maybe some user testing, you you deploy it to a few machines, especially um, if there's some question about compatibility, um, uh, uh, so that that you're not um, you know. Uh, fully committed until um, you, you know you you basically sort of uh, done that that full evaluation. Um, one um, uh, uh, additional um, sort of piece that came up, um, which I thought um, again kind of a lesson learned, is um, where where you're buying licenses um, for software or service, you know, a cloud service. Um, is to really think about what your rollout is going to be and whether you need to purchase all those licenses right away or whether it's something that you can do um, uh, progressively as you roll out that software. Because uh, a lot of cloud services start charging um, uh, uh, pretty darn quickly. And those fees may be reasonable when you're actually using that software or, or service um, across the board, but if you know ten percent of your users are working on a, a cloud platform while they're essentially sort of configuring it or 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 getting it ready for the rest of the organization, but you're paying for everybody, um, that could be a lot of additional expense with with very little value. And obviously, legally, that's um, uh, critical that we you know that we're we're mindful of all those expenses and and uh, and that the calculus makes sense. Um, so we, we didn't talk um, uh, um, uh, you know, much you know, in terms of, of getting into the project about change management, but how we get into that project, defining the, you know, the business needs, um, being really clear about your governance, um, being clear about your requirements certainly helps with change management, um, but change management and project management, I would add sort of you know, how we communicate, how we work with folks, how we make sure that the training that we develop for that software fits, um, uh, uh, that we are are not leaving people guessing or or maybe even fearful that um, we're going to interrupt their work, especially when they're pretty much everyone's working on deadline and um, and we need to um, uh, sort of acknowledge the the challenges of you know doing um, you know the the day to day client work while also changing um, these systems. Um, uh, I I think the um, uh, again, the, the the level of engagement, the level of, of focus that you you know you need to start to you know think about when selecting a product, um, again varies by how broadly it's um, it's going to be used. So you know if it's a specialized piece of software for bankruptcy, for instance, it will affect you know and affects like five percent or ten percent of your users. It's going to be a lot easier than something um, like a document management system would or a phone system would. 
Um, uh, so the level of investment of your time and effort um, uh, to support your users is gonna, gonna vary. Um, so that's uh, it in a nutshell. And I wanna, you know, uh, uh, you know again, um, uh, thank Kamra for her involvement in, in helping us um, uh, come up with some of these um, uh, sort of high points and, and turn um, right now to more of the specific uh, sort of experiences from, uh, from Jay and Stacy who are, are dealing with uh, and have, have managed software selection um, uh, on the front line for a number of years. Uh, oh, sorry, and, and before we do that, um, again, I, I think if, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing out your thoughts on, um, on what the value would be for your organization um, in terms of, uh, of having a, a better software selection process. That would, that would help us in terms of uh, um, responding to your, your, your current issues. Jay, if you wouldn't mind taking it away. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, John. Um, so yeah, just a little background first on my organization's role uh, within Minnesota. Uh, we're legal services state support, and so we're kind of the state support agency in Minnesota, and we work uh, very collaboratively with the legal aid and other access to justice organizations in Minnesota. Um, so we're not providing direct service, but we're um, you know doing a lot of that background work. And the the story I wanted to share, which we Stacy and I wanted to share some stories to try to illustrate some of the points, the high points that uh, that John had shared. The give a little bit more context to what this can look like when it's actually playing out in real life. Um, so the story that I wanted to share is um, is a process that a few organizations in Minnesota undertook um, recently in the last year or two. Um, so my office, State Support, was approached by one of the legal aid organizations in Minnesota who um, was interested in looking into other immigration form software. They were using a software. Um, they weren't. They were unhappy with some of the um, the features or lack of features offered by that software, and so they wanted to see what was out there. And since my office uh, works on a lot of technology projects, they asked if we had any insight. And then they also had a really um, just great suggestion, and they said, "Hey, um, we've heard from other." Uh, partner organizations that uh, nobody's really happy with their various immigration form software. So maybe we could all get together and tackle this project um, as a collaboration. And so we had uh, eventually five organizations joined together to uh, look at uh, what the landscape was of immigration form software out there um, and undertake that software selection process collaboratively. Um, so what that looked like kind of in a bit more detail is uh, we had five organizations and we had um, a couple of initial meetings with representatives from each of those organizations where we really um, hammered out what are the requirements that we absolutely need to have in order to um, make it a solution uh, that will work for the various use cases at those organizations. And we'll also, you know, make it worth making that switch from the existing systems that various organizations were, um, were currently using. Um, and then we also had our list of what are the nice to haves. Like this would really enhance the, the, um, the process of filling out forms and make it easier so that we can devote more time to clients. Um, but it's not going to be a make or break. Um, and one of the great things about having the five different organizations present was that we had a lot of different perspectives, um, not just from the different roles that those organizations played. So we had one organization or two organizations that do only immigration. We had three organizations that do general legal services and immigration was one piece of that. Uh, we had organizations that were primarily staff attorney organizations. And then we had a couple who work uh, pretty extensively with volunteers. So they wanted to, to know how will this work if we have volunteer attorneys that need to use these systems. Um, and then beyond just the different niches that these organizations play and their different perspectives, um, because we had the different organizations, they also sent different uh, representatives who played different roles with those organizations. So we had from um, one of the largest organizations, they sent um, one of their IT managers. 
And so that was really helpful to have that very specific IT perspective. Um, and then we also had you know, management um, helping out. We had staff attorneys, um, volunteer coordinators. Um, so we had all of these perspectives, but each organization was only sending one to three representatives to help us through this process. Um, so it wasn't a huge, um, as huge of a commitment for those organizations. So once we had our list of requirements and nice to haves, um, my office, um, and I'll give a shout out to Amanda Sauber, who was on this webinar. She researched the field of different um, vendors who might be able to provide a solution. Um, and then also reached out, I think she also reached out to Ellis and Tap. So thank you, Ellis and Tap, to see what other folks were using. And from that, we um, put together a list of um, the potential vendors and kind of the uh, uh, the pluses and minuses of the various vendors. And then we came back together as a group to select finalists. Um, so we uh, looked at how the different vendors matched up for our requirements and nice to have, um, and then looked at pricing, of course, um, to see which ones would be the best fit. Um, from that point, we set up demos um, and interviews which, with um, each of our top four finalists. Um, so we had everybody come together, got a little demo of how the different um, software solutions worked, um, got to ask questions of the sales reps. Um, and then another really cool aspect of having all the orgs work together is that um, each of the organizations took one or two of the finalists to um, take back to their organizations and demo. We got a demo account for, um, for I think all of the solutions. Um, and so um, everybody went back and they did their assignments, um, like testing out how the, the software actually worked um, in real life. Um, and then a couple of weeks after that, we came back together, um, compared notes. Um, throughout all of this, um, it was really helpful to have Amanda as a centralized project manager. She was the one who was trying to schedule 15 people, find time for a meeting. She was the one who was making sure that we were taking good notes and then sharing them out so that everybody stayed on the same page. Uh, and then she was also the one who was coordinating with the vendor um, to set up demos and, and um, would gather questions from everybody and then batch those to the different vendors that we were talking with. Um, so once we had uh, uh, established our requirements, done our basic research, um, done our testing and demos. We then collaborative, collaboratively um, made our, our final selection and the group was able to agree upon um, one of the vendors who they felt would best uh, meet the needs that we all had. Um, this was a vendor who was um, a little bit newer to the legal aid space in terms of immigration form software. And because they were really trying to break into this field, uh, they were willing to do some of the integration work with our um, state's case management system, but the, we all use the same case management system. Um, uh, they were able to comp some of that work um, because they saw um, viability and in using those same integrations um, throughout the country if other legal aid uh, organizations decided to, to hop on board. Um, in addition, when we were doing negotiating contracts, um, we still had separate contracts for each organization that ultimately decided to contract with this vendor, um, but we were able to um, do a little bit of collaborative negotiation, which I think helped us as well, um, because we had several orgs um, um, trying to get a better price, which um, I think we were able to get a little bit of a bulk discount. You never know how well you're doing in negotiation, right? But I think that um, that it was helpful. Um, one of the the pieces I wanted to touch on, which is uh, one of the things we wish we would have done, is that um, while we did have um, that IT person helping out from one of the organizations, and they did um, uh, make sure that we had certain security protocols like multi-factor authentication and accounting for those kinds of security issues, uh, we wish that we had worked with um, a security consultant uh, who who could have helped us create a list of questions that. Uh, we would want to know to make sure that the company security practices were up to um, up to uh, were were as good as they could be, um, and to help us interpret it, interpret the responses that we got from those questions, um, because um, 
none of us were security experts at that level. And you just don't know what you don't know. Um, so you don't necessarily know which questions to ask. Um, and you don't necessarily know when it gets to a certain level of technicality, if the responses um, are meaningful and if they um, are, um, are satisfactory uh, in terms of security best practices. So that's a process that we're currently working with Just Tech on right now, just to make sure. Um, and, and one of the reasons I, I think this is, is kind of assumed, but just to state it explicitly, just with the kind of information and the sensitive information that gets collected in, in immigration forms, um, we really felt like we needed to make sure that security was like absolutely best practices um, because that info is so is so sensitive. Um, so if it were a different project where we didn't have like personally identifying information, uh, we probably wouldn't go to those links. Um, but um, taking a step back and realizing um, the use case, we felt like it was really important that, and it would have been great to do that um, upfront so that we could use that in our evaluation in terms of selecting which vendor to go with. Um, so those are the high points. Um, anything else you'd like me to touch on, John? Well, you know, it's, okay, I think it's great. And you, and you yeah. kind of touched on almost everything in the outline. I, you know, I would say that um, in terms of some questions, the CIS controls, which are available for free, um, you know, to, to look at that. NIST has its own um, security uh, standards that, you know, that, that vendors who, you know, are, are trying to sell the, well, to the Pentagon, but certainly the federal government as well, uh, need to meet, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, I, I think one of the big frustrations with, you know, the, the range of cloud service providers, and, you know, again, that's where we're getting a lot of our software, a lot of our integrations are happening cloud to cloud, um, is, is that it is really difficult to, to, you know, qualify and quantify the security of each vendor, especially if they're not all really large organizations um, that have met like SOC 2 type 2 sort of certification standards, right? And so, um, uh, I, I think, again, this is, I mean, Shelley's um, has, again, really sort of pushed the collaboration, the working together, you know, negotiating together on pricing. I think it's, you know, like a buyer's club. I think we need to continue as a community to move forward together in that um, sort of uh, evaluation, that security evaluation, because it is expensive. It's, it's time intensive. Um, and some of these, you know, companies inherently are doing that because they're selling to a very broad range of, of customers like the Pentagon. And so they've got, you know, they're like document management systems out there that say we're DOD compliant. It's like, okay, good. <laughs> you know? So that's, uh, that's, a, that's sort of one thing we can check off, but a lot of, uh, a lot of our uh, vendors are not, and, and maybe don't need to be either. And so it, it really sort of depends on that role, but I think it's, it's, a uh, um, I mean, the, you know, the collaborating, I, we didn't, we didn't talk about this before, but, you know, um, in, in New York, when I was at Legal Services NYC, when we were looking at case management systems, we invited the other providers in New York City to uh, join the discussion, join the, the requirements gathering process and, and the evaluation process. So to the extent you can do that collectively, you're, you know, even if you don't save time yourself, you are helping the community and advancing um, the awareness of your, uh, you know, sisters and brothers in the community of, about what's out there. So um, I would just say that even if you're going to make a selection um, just for your own organization, if, if it's okay with your leadership to involve others who might be interested. Um, and, and generally, I think you're going you're gonna to benefit. You're going to understand um, a, a different perspective, and that's going to help you in your requirements or in your selection. But thank you, Jay. I think it's, I mean, it's, I, I love, I mean, to the extent that more and more states are working kind of more collectively, I think, you know, Minnesota has certainly been um, a leader that way. And, and with their case management system implementations and their online portals and everything else, it's, um, uh, I think the quality and the value has been a, a lot higher. Stacey, uh, shall we turn, turn the, uh, the mic over to you? Sure. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, Jay. Uh, I, I am the executive director of the Legal Aid Society of San Mateo County, which is a direct services program. So we're kind of the opposite of Jay's perspective. Um, we're a single county program, kind of old school legal services. Um, and we do work with partners in the county. And that's one of the two stories that I wanted to 
to, to touch on is related to that where, um, so there's two projects that I wanna talk about. And the first one was, an, uh, we're trying to construct an eviction database uh, that us and uh, our kind of primary partner in the housing space in the county would be able to access and that we would both, it's really just a, really just a dashboard. That's all we we're trying to create was it was a visualization so that we could see each other's cases. V evictions are very fast paced, as I'm sure all of you know. Um, so getting them out and making sure that you've done, done a very quick prioritization. Is a sustainable, sustainable tendency? Is it a high risk or a highly vulnerable uh, client? You know, or is this one of the ones that we really want to get full representation to now uh, before the, you know, as early in the eviction process as possible? So that was the idea, was to grab case data from our case management database and from our partner's case management database and just really just show it um, so that we could look at it and then we could kind of grab and quickly assign cases out. And there was a third partner that was just gonna be kind of a view only, but they were gonna be grab some cases as well. So it was meant to be um, a very, uh, not very detailed information. Um, we do have HIPAA constraints, so we wanted to make sure that we weren't sharing any kind of health data. So we're really trying to minimize personally identifiable information. We obviously needed addresses so that you could tell who you were talking about, but trying to minimize uh, PII and um, make it all very quick, very accessible, very visual. Um, and I made lots of mistakes in this process and I'll just touch on a few of them. The main thing was not really drilling down with the partner. I was dealing with somebody at the partner who was probably more in the accidental techie space rather than a true IT person because they didn't have an IT person. Um, they had people who knew how to use their database and that's who I was working with. Um, but it turned out that he was not the person who was the contract person with the vendor for their database. And so when we got to the point of like, okay, how are we gonna access your API? Like we need to get into your case management so we can pull the data out. No one knew how to do that. And then when they got to the point of actually talking to the vendor, the vendor said no. So really just Hopefully Stacy's internet's gonna come right back. Uh, well, so while we're waiting for Stacy, I mean, I think one of the things that that Stacy shared with us was, you know, that again, you have these 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 plans for a collaborative um, project and selecting, you know, sort of for data visualization, you're and selecting sort of a platform with the understanding that, you know, pieces um, uh, or responsibilities are going to be met by um, by all the partners, and I, I I think it's sort of like you really have to vet. Um, you know, down in 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 the depths to really understand, um, uh, uh, you know, what the potential sort of challenges are with the software integrations are again more and more common, um, and maybe we also have an expectation that that the um, the integration is just going to work and it's not going to require additional development. Um, but I think some of what you know, uh, uh, Stacy was sharing with us was was you know that that uh, um, that those um, uh, challenges are not insignificant still. Um, and certainly with older platforms in particular, it can be more challenging um, or with vendors who are overloaded maybe with their own uh, development work and they don't really have time to address an integration need that you have. Um, so when you're selecting a system, when you're with what that's gonna be used by multiple partners and California has a number of examples of that, um, uh, it is inherently more complex. Um, so you're, 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 you know, so the scale of your um, uh, requirements gathering and your evaluation um, need to go up um, accordingly. I don't know, Jay, if you want to add anything to, um, again, hopefully Stacy will be able to re rejoin, but from our past conversation. I think I'm back. Oh, you're back. Okay. Am I back? Yes. Sorry about that. I, apparently Comcast chose today to work in our neighborhood. Um, so, uh, I was hoping that wouldn't happen, but sorry about that. Um, so it's, yeah, so that was one issue was really drilling down on the partners technical requirements and access. Um, another one was um, a, a budgeting issue that, you know, that John uh, mentioned earlier on really drilling down into the issues of licensing that would that would be, you know, ongoing from, you know, after the project was done. So we had, you know, we had done an RFP process. We were very clear on what the development process was going to cost us. Um, and we selected a, a vendor who wanted to use Tableau for the visualization part of it, which made total sense to me, um, you know,
Stacy, I don't know if you can hear us, but your audio just cut off. I apologize, everyone. Um, I guess, Jay, while we're waiting for Stacy's audio to come back, do you want to um, uh, share sort of, you know, kind of relevant uh, experience or, or, you know, to what, you know, Stacy was talking about with hidden costs and... and uh... Yeah, I think the, um, I think, you know, Stacy was going to say, wasn't, uh, she wasn't aware of the ongoing tableau of license fees that they would have to pay. Um, we've had, um, Kind of a similar situation recently, actually, where we had some data visualization software as well that um, that Minnesota went with, and then we we recently discovered the monthly cost is going up like double. Um, so even if you are um, as prepared as you can be in like understanding the ongoing, um, you can always have surprises and have have those costs increase. And, and, I, and I think in some projects that we've been involved in, we, we have gotten vendors to agree that, you know, what's the cap, what's the most, oh, Stacy's back, but like, just to make sure that you know that the inflator can't be like 30% or 40%, um, because once you're involved in this software, it's really hard to, to switch out. There's all the, all those transactional costs. Stacy, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet and pass, pass the mic back to you. <laughs> Sorry again, and, and Jay hit it right. It was the Tableau licensing that I hadn't really looked into. I hadn't, um, I'd used Tableau um, just you know a little bit, but I didn't realize that you had to have kind of a minimum number of licenses that you were committed to. I didn't know you could just get one. So just didn't do my due diligence on the licensing model and figuring out what the ongoing cost would be. Um, so that was one issue. And then the other issue on Tableau was uh, the, the vendor had opposed using that as a standard visualization, visualization platform rather than building something custom, which made total sense to us. But it turned out over time that that wasn't really a core expertise for them. So they were prepared to set it up. But then a year later, when we came down to kind of or sometime later, when we were wanted some tweaks or wanted to figure something out, their one Tableau person had left and they hadn't replaced that expertise. And so we just didn't, weren't able to get help from them on that. So that was a, again, a, a, a kind of a, a somewhere where I should have talked to them more about how, how well integrated the Tableau piece was into their core offerings. Cause they were, turns out they're really, you know, very strong development shop, but the Tableau part was a little bit of an overlay that one person had expertise in. Um, so lots of mistakes in that project. Uh, the other project that I wanted to talk about was much more successful and, and is, you know, being used as an important part of our work today, and that's an online intake project. And uh, this goes more into the, um, the change management pieces that Hamros was going to talk about. And that we, I think it was pretty a pretty good process in many aspects of the set, setup of it, and that um, our vendor, you know, really made it very easy for anyone to test it and access it and uh, in, in development and also to put in their comments. You know, he created a spreadsheet that everyone could add to and he would actually respond directly to each comment in there. So there was a very good involvement of multiple staff people, some who were kind of formal testers and others who uh, were just invited. You know, anybody who wanted to could participate in testing the product as it went along. And so I think all of the development pieces and the uh, identifying bugs and, and, and just user interface issues that didn't work like people thought they should all of those pieces I thought went pretty well. And so I think their biggest issue in the change management was not was really not talking through with people. Why are we doing this and what does it mean? We got the, why are we doing this piece, which was, it was, a, it was really a COVID response. You know, we'd moved from an almost exclusively an in-person model where clients were on the whole filling out their intake sheets in the office, sitting in the reception area with a little bit of help from the receptionist, especially if there were language or literacy issues. Um, but mostly they were filling it in themselves and then it was getting input later on, uh, again, by typically by the admin staff. And we would move to, you know, essentially a phone-based intake system where the program frontline staff were the ones who were suddenly doing the intakes. And they, they said it was taking them an hour or so to just get the basic intake information. You know, where previously the client was just doing it sitting in the waiting room. So it was a huge time suck for our intake staff. Um, and that, that was really what we we're trying to address. And they got that part of it. We communicated that clearly. Like this is, we're addressing a need that you've identified for us. But the piece that we missed was the piece around um, just because the client is now entering the information directly, 
doesn't mean that you just hit accept when it shows up in the case management system as a new intake, right? We didn't talk through with people. You're still, you as the intake person are still responsible for the data quality. Um, just as if you had taken the information on the phone and the client had said, well, my monthly income is $35,000, you would have said, are you sure you don't mean yearly income? <laughs> um, the same thing, if you're, if you're hitting accept for the data into the database, and it's creating a new case and all of that information is in there, uh, you're responsible for doing some kind of a basic common sense check. Does this make sense? Is it consistent with this client who's told you they're on section eight? Um, is it, um, you know, is the birth date, does it make sense? If you sound like you're talking to somebody who's, you know, well into their eighties and their birth date they gave makes them 10, does that make sense? And we didn't talk through that with people. I think there, there was an assumption that, well, the client typed it in, so it's fine. That's the basic data. Um, and that was something we should have just done a much better job with, of just talking about, and I think just abstracting it a little bit to why does data quality matter, right? Why does it matter what's in the database? And a lot of that is client-based, right? You need to know who you're working with. And if you're doing, especially if you're doing an eviction case, it's actually important to know what their real income is, um, as well as, uh, you know, grant reporting and, and other funding you know, a lot of the data that we collect is does map to funder requirements or, or deliverables. So we just didn't do a good job of that overall uh, thinking through what is this going to mean? Who's responsible for the data quality? What are expectations for the line staff as they're reviewing? So we did a good job of saying, this is what it's going to look like. This is what the screen is going to be like. This is how you hit the button to push it in. This is how we're going to eliminate duplicates and sort of the technical aspects of it. But we didn't really talk through what you're responsible for with it and what our expectations are of what you will do with that data. Um, and, and, that was, and that was a mistake on our part. So it's, so it's like you got the, the right solution in a sense, you've got the, the, the software selection, the, the implementation, mm -hmm. but you didn't anticipate that, that we're changing our workflow and, mm -hmm. and, and, our, and our pro not just a flow, but our process, right? Like you mm -hmm. now need to add another step, that quality assurance mm -hmm. step that you didn't have to do quite the same way before. Mm -hmm. Or it was implicit going from paper, you see the client in front of you and you, you now start entering it and you can ask those follow-up questions more naturally. Um, yeah, right. that, it, again, it's like, these are these yeah. hidden sort of challenges. Um, uh, yeah. Jay, and, and so, uh, sorry, Stacey, any other points before we kind of move a little bit more on to, to, to Hammer's? Uh, I mean, I think we've got, we've, we've, we've addressed some of the, um, the, the change management um, you know, planning and, and anticipation, um, but anything else you want to add before we move? Just to follow up on what you just said, you're, you're absolutely right. It was a workflow mapping or a process mapping issue where we, we should have done a better job of sort of mapping what the different steps are. So not just like hit go here, but there's actually building in that formal step of you know, look at the data, here are the things where clients typically make errors when they're doing this kind of an in data input, make sure you're reviewing those key parts, then you hit go or, you know, whatever that, whatever that order is. So it's a, the, really making sure that your mapping is really very, is, is very clear. That's, yeah. a, that's a good point. Great. Um, so um, I, again, we'll, we'll ask uh, Hamra if she wants to share some, um, some of her comments in the resources when we publish the, uh, the webinar um, with with Shelley's help, um, but uh, um, oh, it's, it's seems like whenever I advance that slide, that next slide it goes it has a mind of its own to go on to the next. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know, Jay, anything uh, else or or Stacy, you want to add on change management or project management? I think you you both you both brought that into the into the discussion, but yeah, I think Stacy's story made me think of one one story from my past. Um, Kind of relate it to that change management piece and kind of what you may or may not anticipate. So when I first started um, at State Support almost 10 years ago, I was in charge of our online intake systems um, in Minnesota, and we had a previous version. Um, and I remember I um, was talking to one of the intake staff at one of our partner organizations, and I learned that for like a couple of years, um, our online intake system um, had been hadn't been importing into their case management system like it had been designed to. Um, and so these poor intake folks had been um, grabbing this XML file 
and then transcribing the relevant information into their from this like code into their case management system. And you know, needless to say, they um, did not like online intake. Did not think that it was saving time at all because it wasn't. Um, but it just made me realize, and I don't think we've gotten this perfect by any means, but like the importance of also thinking about like as this is implemented, that people know what to do when there's a problem. They know who to reach out to because it was like a centralized system that was sending data out to different organizations, case management systems, and every at that time we were all on different case management systems. So everything was a little different. And um, folks just weren't sure at it. Like, did they reach out to their manager? Do they reach out to their case management system vendor? Do they reach out to asset state support? And so a lot of things were breaking down without anybody ever knowing. And then of course um, it makes um, for a terrible experience um, on the intake staff worker side. So um, just one other kind of issue to, to think through as you're thinking about what are the processes that need to be in place as you're, um, preparing to implement a new piece of software. Yeah. Stacy, anything else you'd like to add um, now? Or? The one thing I wanted to add, I think Hamra was gonna talk about security considerations to, it's, uh, to some extent. So I wanna just add one thing that, you know, one thing we found is that sometimes you end up losing some functionality or maybe, you know, not choosing the, the cleanest solution technically um, you, sometimes you're giving something up in exchange for, in our case, you know, HIPAA business associate agreement or something like that, um, especially being, you know, relatively small program, not everybody's willing to kind of negotiate with us on a kind of a, a, a you know, on a, on a one-off basis. And if we need that business associate agreement and we need something else from thinking of our, you know, and this isn't even software, right? It's our phone system. Um, but we wanted SMS and we know we can't, we know they can't do a business associate agreement for SMS. So we said, well, can you just exclude it from the agreement, right? We'll do a business associate agreement around the phone stuff. And then can you exclude the SMS? Because we need our clients to be able to text us. We understand that's not going to be covered. And th there's a very limited you know, group of vendors who are willing to do that. Um, and so we ended up with a solution that we don't love, but that does allow clients to text documents to us um, and also allows us to have that HIPAA protection on the phone side. So sometimes you do give stuff up um, in exchange for that, those security considerations, or if that's really compliance, I guess, more than mm -hmm. anything. Right. And, 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 it, and, it sounds, and knowingly doing so is a lot better than finding out after <laughs> the fact. And so again, like, I, I think part of what we've in in working um, on this topic, I think part of what we found is we needed to both dive deep into you know like the you know, particular requirements, compliance, the vendor analysis and, and research and demos, and also broad. We need to think about sort of what are all the other factors um, around change management, around the context, our partners that we're going to work with, um, our vendor staff sometimes in their capacities. <laughs> Um, how we do the project management, that these are, that you can't, to be successful, you really have to be considering all these other environmental, I guess, factors in addition to selecting a really good tool. So I think, Stacey, your point about building out, you know, a good online intakes, you know, tool was great. And 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 the, and the, the thing that could have been better was how you thought about these other factors of, of that quality assurance that's going to be related to that that workflow or that or that business process that you needed to change. Um, so they're inexorably linked, I think. You know, we've got we've got to be sort of thinking about this holistically. Maybe a term used too much, but but um, uh, but how holistic, how broad, and how deep is? I, I, there's not a one size fits all. I think what we what we I think have all agreed on is that it depends really on the project on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, uh, but, but to do that analysis at the, at the, at the beginning, um, and make knowing decisions, um, and document it, um, whether you're using an Excel, I, I think, um, Stacey, you're sort of, you know, or, or even it was a Google doc or Google spreadsheet, you know, like a very basic tool to sort of come up with your list of requirements. Um, you know, one of the th things I would, um, and, and, uh, I, I think they're, there's a fair bit of this going on already in the community, but I would suggest is that if you are selecting some particular software system is to ask others for their selection process documents or their RFPs. And I think LSNTAP has some of that. Shelly, is that fair? Some of those resources? 
I'm not sure. <laughs> I'd be happy to check, but we certainly have the archives from the listserv. Yeah. Yeah. So there's certainly RFPs available there. Um, as far as I've I've never seen a vendor selection worksheet, but mm -hmm. that is something that um, I'm always looking for things that we can provide for the community. And I made note a few moments ago about a list of security questions to ask vendors. So I think yeah. those two resources would be something that um, we will start considering putting together for the community. Yeah. And I think if you like, I, I just did um, some Googling before this around, you know, that vendor selection workbooks and stuff like that. And so there are some tools out there. They're, you know, I, I think people typically want you to give them that your name and email address before they share that resource. And so, you know, but, um, but, but having a more formalized process. Um, and then we want to just share a few uh, resources. And as you can see on the screen, um, uh, that we, where we think it would be, you know, worth again, not just going to lsntap.org, but certainly emailing out to the list if you're starting a process. We see that pretty routinely. People are are saying what they're about to do, and uh, and so you get some peer support. Um, Shelly, even I guess sort of tech support if they reach out to LSNTAP for some tech support. The um, American Bar Association has had um, uh, uh, you know a, a big focus on legal tech for for years, and so they've got some um, I think some pretty decent resources. LSCs past, um, you know, TIG grants and so on. So, and 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 again, going to um, uh, tech conferences, state or or national, um, uh, and and you know, learning from others. And and I, I think you know, again, I, one of the biggest uh, collaborative efforts I was a part of uh, years ago was um, uh, HCA. That that's again how Stacy and I met um, the Health Consumer Alliance in California and. And part of what I think you were able to do, Stacey, together was a lot more than you would have been able to, you know, like because you could resource, pool the dollars together, do that selection process, have that negotiation. Um, and you ended up with um, a solution, I think, that was much better than the than the prior iteration, right? That 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 you know, I just remember people waiting hours for a basic report, or maybe that's exaggeration, but way too long to get some basic data. Um, that they needed, and uh, and every time you know there was a change in, in a requirement, it was it was a real pain to you know push out those changes. So so again, working collaboratively, being very you know methodical, um, generally leads to um, a better result, better economies. Any other? Uh, and so we're going to publish. Uh, sorry, I just want to. Um, so if you have um, questions for any of us. Um, uh, you know, please, uh, uh, I guess, feel free to, to reach out. Um, everybody agreed to share their email addresses. Oh, and again, one click and it just keeps going. Um, uh, we're, um, uh, again, going to post the, um, uh, sorry, uh, we're going to post the, the, the PowerPoint deck and some additional resources um, after uh, the webinar. Um, if you do have um, some, I, I saw some, some great comments in the chat, but if you have some other questions or thoughts you'd like to add, please, um, uh, please do.